Ray's going to take that us out, but basically what I would recommend, you go check out his website, you go check out his, um, his podcast and everything else that he does. So over to you, Ray. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks everyone. Um, so I'm a bit of a late inclusion to this. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me relatively well. It's a pretty small room, but... Um, Doesn't matter, no excuses. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. Um, so uh, r- relatively late inclusion, and Les, uh, someone actually dropped out, and Les said, oh, can you, can you pinch it? And I said, oh, yeah, sure. Um, but when, when he described, you know, what the kind of couple of days was going to be about, he said, look, it's, it's about kind of the future and, and, and how does lubricants kind of play a role in that future. So we're going to talk a little bit about lubricants and sustainability and where does that sort of fit into the future. So I'm going to try and throw a few numbers at you. If there's some takeaways, it's the big numbers on the screen. So the first one is 23%. So probably a little known fact, but uh, 23% of all the energy that's produced in the world and consumed is completely lost due to friction. So of that, basically 20% is actually friction that's wasted due to vibration, heat, all that kind of stuff, and then 3% goes into having to remanufacture parts that were worn prematurely because we haven't lubricated them correctly. So that's 23%. So what, what is the role that lubricants play in our efforts for sustainability? So more or less, it comes down to three things. It's energy efficiency, it's machine reliability, and it's the enablement of renewable technologies, most of which don't actually happen unless we have an adequate lubrication strategy. And these are things which are probably a little bit underappreciated um, in, in industry. So, my name is Rafe, and over the last 24 hours, I've been known as the Lube Boy. Um, <laughs> but, it's yeah, it is, it is sticky. It's best when you're in the lubricant industry to just like steer into the skin, right? You, you're already this far. It, funnily enough, uh, uh, the academics in this particular field have gotten sick of having to introduce themselves as lubrication engineers. And they come, come up with a, a fancy word called tribologist, right? Now, tribologist comes from the Greek word to rub. So they're, they're rubbing specialists, which I'm not sure is any better <laughs> than a lubrication engineer. But anyway, in the industry, um, I'm kind of known as the, well, well I self style myself as the lubrication expert. But basically, um, the sustainability is kind of core to, to what I do as a, as a business. So even in the logo, which I had to re- redo relatively recently, thanks to a trademark dispute, um, so it's the, it's the oil drop, it's a gear for machine reliability, but the void space in the middle is actually a lead for sustainability. Because I think that the two are completely interlinked. You sort of can't do sustainability and machine reliability without thinking about your lubrication strategy. So if you think that being the lubrication expert is relatively nerdy, it gets worse than that. I do have a YouTube channel called Lubrication Explained, which does what it says on the tin. And I have a podcast called Lubrication Experts, where I interview experts in particular fields, you know, you'd be surprised how narrow people can get in particular fields, whether it's development of new fluids for EVs or hydrogen combustion, which we'll get into a little bit later. All right, so where does this 23% number come from? I didn't just like pull it out of my butt. There's actually, believe it or not, there is an entire journal which is dedicated to the study of friction. And there was a 2017 paper which identified this sort of number. So 23% of all that world's energy is lost due to friction, like I said before. Now, feasibly, how much do we think that we can make a dent in that? They're sort of saying, look, it's, it's, it's unfeasible that we're gonna get rid of all friction, so what's the size of the prize here? If we can reduce about 40% of that, which they said is probably, probably feasible, that would amount to savings of about 1.4% of GDP annually. But the thing is, when you break down GDP, most of GDP comes from the services sector, right? So the lady who's doing your wife's nails, right, on the weekends, or the IT department, realistically, friction plays no role in, in what they do in their economic output. So when you upscale it for just the industry and the agricultural industries, realistically the size of the prize for us in the room is in the order of about 5%, right? So that's the size of the prize that we're talking about. About 5% of your total budget is potentially being lost due to inadequate lubrication, right? And that's that's obviously a a 30,000 foot view, but broadly speaking, that's the size of the prize that we're talking about. So the first component of that is about using energy efficient lubricants. And this is something that people don't really concentrate on very much, right? So what do I mean by energy efficient lubricants? Well, what we really need to understand is how do we lose energy through lubrication? So easiest way, let's talk about one of the simplest mechanical systems, right? Just gears. 
Everyone understands how gears work. I don't need to explain that to this particular audience. But let's say, for example, we take the simplest enclosed gear drive, which is just splash lubricated. Okay? Where am I losing energy? I'm losing energy in a couple of places, right? The drag that's on the seals, simply churning through the lubricant. When we say windage, I've got to move the air around inside the gearbox, and then circulation. So sometimes I have to move the lubricant up, you know, up to the oil galleries in order to get it to the right place. Okay? I also lose a little bit in the gear, gear mesh, as well as in the bearings themselves. Now, broadly speaking, if you break those up, the things which are in that gold cover, we would say are lubricant related, right? And on the left, that's got to do with the viscosity, right? So, you can imagine that as I'm having to churn through the lubricant, the higher the viscosity is, the more work I'm having to do to move the gear through that lubricant. I think that's relatively obvious. So, one of the things that we're always threading the needle on when we are selecting lubricants is, we need sufficient viscosity that we're not going to damage whatever equipment it is, gears or bearings. But anything more than that, all we're doing is losing energy. So that's always the needle that we're trying to thread, is we need to choose the minimum viscosity that is sufficient, but no higher than that. And there's a lot of work that's being done where basically a lot of people are over lubricating machine elements, and that's just a waste of energy. Now everything on the right has got to do more with the actual molecular structure of the lubricant itself. So, something that's maybe not appreciated so much is that if you were to look, and this is true of bearings as well, but I'm just going to talk about gears, right? If you look right at the intermesh of the gear tech, what's going on there? The ultimate kind of point of a lubricant, and the reason we use them, is because we're trying to separate those gear teeth from each other. Right? If they actually come into contact, they wear down really, really fast. So, how is it that especially in like large gear sets, you know, you think about the open gear sets on, on ball mills, right, at mine sites. How is it that with such high load, then a, a simple liquid is able to separate those gear things? So it's all about the, the way that the lubricant kind of transforms in that load zone. So there's a pressure viscosity relationship. As they are placed under stress, and they, as they go into really high pressure, lubricants actually go through what's called a glass transformation phase. Right? where they effectively turn into a glass structure. So it's almost like a solid, but it's amorphous, it's not crystalline. Now you can imagine that when things become a solid like that, it is very difficult for those molecules to move past each other. So there's a certain amount of internal friction that is generated in the lubricant itself, which contributes to heat. Right? And this is where synthetic lubricants start to play a role. So if I could kind of you know, uh, take a little bit of a, a sidewalk here. When you have a mineral oil, you pull it out of the ground, I always say it's like having a box of Lego, right? All sorts of different shapes and sizes. And the refining process is about taking all of that mixed Lego and organizing it into piles which are roughly the same shape and the same size, right? Now, that process is always imperfect. And so as those pieces are trying to slide past each other, because they're all different shapes and sizes, they generate a lot more friction than a synthetic one. Now a synthetic is like if I had a box of Lego, but it was all four by two Lego bricks, right? And I individually put them together to build myself the shape of molecule that I want. And because they're all the same size and the same shape, they flow past each other much more readily, right? That means we generate a lot less heat, we lose a lot less energy due to friction. Now, so far that's theoretical, right? But in the real world, you can see the impact, right? So this is from, from mobile, obviously I used to work there. On the left-hand side is a worm gear drive that's lubricated with middle oil, same viscosity oil, but in the synthetic. It's, sorry, is on the left and the middle is on the right, right? Way less heat produced, way less friction. Now in a worm gear drive, that's sort of the optimal application because there's a lot of sliding that goes on, right? So you get the most energy efficiency benefit. But typically when we're talking about energy input versus output, that saving will be in the order of like six to 7%, simply by changing the oil that's being used, right? something that almost every business is completely overlooking. And that's not just true of gearboxes, right? So let's say, for example, um, this was a study that was done by Royal Purple looking at uh, compression of ammonia in refrigeration applications. Now here, you get sort of a double benefit. People often don't think about the, the incremental benefits that happen downstream. So first of all, simply by changing to a correct synthetic lubricant, we get the benefit of the energy efficiency, whether that's the interaction at, at, the, uh, at the bearings or the gears 
depending on whether it's a reciprocating or a screw compressor, right? Now, on top of that, what are the other benefits that you get? Well, in a screw compressor, the oil is also acting as a gasket. It's like a seal, right? So as the lobes are rotating, the thing that's actually sealing is the oil itself, right? It seals off that gas pocket, and as you go further down the line, you compress the gas. So the efficiency of that seal plays a role in the efficiency of the compressor. Further downstream, we're also affected by the amount of oil carryover. So if you use the wrong lubricant and you get way more oil carryover into the heat exchangers, they start to plate out the heat exchangers, you lose that efficient, the, the thermal efficiency of the heat exchanger, right? And so simply by tra uh, transitioning to the correct lubricant, you increase the efficiency of the heat exchanger as well. So simply by changing out to the correct lubricants, right, they were seeing savings, energy savings of anywhere between four and 37% which is a crazy high number for the amount of money that you need to spend on the oil. This also translates, for example, into hydraulic packs. Using higher viscosity index uh, lubricants, you can typically save in the order of about six to seven percent on hydraulic efficiency, right? Again, it's a simple change from one oil to another. It's really not that hard. All right, so that's the first thing. The next component of, of sustainability is about the failure of, uh, of of machines, right? If we can avoid uh, machines failing, we don't need to replace them. Therefore, all the energy and carbon that goes into manufacturing uh, new, new, uh, new machines. Okay, so what's the size of the prize here? So broadly speaking, there's a whole bunch of different studies that have been done here. But broadly speaking, they would say that roughly the cost of machine failure globally is about a trillion dollars, right? Sometimes it varies, 700 million, 1.3 trillion, but it's all around that sort of ballpark. All right. Now, the, what is the impact of lubricant? So this is not coming from the lubricants company, unless you think it's uh, a conflict of interest. Let's say Vickers, who, who manufacture hydraulic systems, they say about 80% of hydraulic system failures are due to contamination, right? How does the contaminant get into the hydraulic pack in the first place? It's gotta be by the hydraulic oil. Um, and this is uh, sort of a theme that will come up a lot. You know, everyone's heard of the Pareto principle, that 80-20 rule, generally, 80% of a lot of failures are coming down to a handful of, of different causes, right? But it's not just hydraulic packs, you know? If you talk to SKF, they really designed their bearings basically to last forever, but it's contamination of the lube oil that ultimately destroys the bearings through kind of, uh, de you know, debris denting and things like that. All right, so when you actually look into it, what SKF says, if you break down the causes of bearing failure, okay, let's ignore the others or unknown, because they're literally unknown, but if you look at what, well, contamination in, and inadequate lubrication, that makes up about 75 to 80% of the remainder. So again, coming up with the same number. And it's not just SKF. So this is from Emerson bearings, very, very similar. So if you add up incorrect lubricant choice, aged lubricant, solid contamination, liquid contamination, and insufficient lubricant, what number do you get? You get 80, 20 again. Left side, the lay of the point, Cummins in engine bearings. So this is not rolling element bearings, this is plain bearings, same thing. Contamination failures, which get there by the engine oil. Surface reaction failures is a corrosion issue, which again, you, it's corrosion because of the engine oil, as well as lubricant failures. Again, this time it's 85, 15, right? But everything coalesces around to one another. So let's say, I, I try not to overstate it. Let's say it will understate it a little bit. And we'll say that, okay, of those failures, I'll give you 70%, right? 70% of the machine failures are potentially lubrication related. So that, again, one of the big numbers I'd like you to take away from this one. So that's the, that's the size of the prize that we're talking about. So you would think that because this is so important, that this would be reflected in people's attitudes towards precision lubrication. And so the guys at reliabilityweb.com uh, Terence O'Hanlon and all his mates uh, did a poll of a few thousand uh, different people in the sort of the maintenance and reliability industry, and they they asked the question, you know, how would you describe the importance of precision lubrication? Overwhelmingly, people recognised that it was very, very important, critically important, right? Eighty percent. So you would think that that's reflective in people's practice, right? Now, I don't know about how you guys feel about most of the lubrication programs that you see on sites, so I wouldn't grade them that well. But even when these people, who all agreed that it was critically important, when they were asked, what is the current state of your lubrication program? 
the vast majority said, not even that it's best practice, but it's not even close to best practice. So there's a huge disconnect between what people want and what they're actually doing. Right? And so, and this is a common, common theme, right? Now, we need to diagnose the problem, right? As engineers, we always want to understand why the problem is the way it is. So why is it that in 70% of cases, we don't have best practice on site? Now, I, I don't have a silver bullet here. If I did, I would be a very rich man. However, I think that when you look at the way that the industry has been shaped over the last few years, you can see some, some common things, right? So one of them, I would put the fault at the lubricant industry itself. Now, if anyone here has received a great degree of technical service from their lube oil provider, is that anyone? Okay. That is generally the case, right? And, and that's because the lube oil companies are, are largely stepping back from that role. Right? Um, in the early 2000s, uh, Mobile had a technical team you know, field services team that was ordered in the hundreds, right, in this country to service the mining sector, power generation, oil and gas, all of that. When I left, I was the last one. The same goes for Shell, the same goes for Castro, right, all the big majors. And where they're getting to is a model which is much more kind of commodity based. You come, you buy the lubricant, if you want help, you call a technical help desk. But the need is still there, right? It's just that the knowledge is completely vanished. So that's the situation that we're in at the moment. At the same time, I think some of the problem is also knowledge based, right? So if you, if you looked at all the people that are on site that are responsible for maintenance and reliability, generally, in my experience, right, the teams are probably 80% mechanical, 20% electrical, broadly speaking. The one thing that's missing there is chemistry, right? And most of what? Well, a lot of lubrication problems are related to chemistry. So there's no overlap in the knowledge domains, which makes it very difficult when you're doing a root cause failure analysis, when ultimately the root cause is one of the chemistry, and you don't understand that chemistry, how are you supposed to figure out the problem? We see this problem a lot, typically in, let's say, for example, worm dries. People using EP style gear oils with yellow metals. One is just gonna corrode the other, but people don't understand it. Right? The other thing is cultural. So if this guy in the middle happens to be the lube tech, then I can say with, let's say 98% confidence, without ever having been to your site, that that guy is the bottom of the social problem, right? He's probably the guy that has never had any training, right? He doesn't have any qualifications. There's no formal qualifications. In some cases, I've seen this guy just picked up off the street. He's just some random guy that goes around greasing motors. Right? Now this is not always the case, but the vast majority of time, that is the case. And yet, that guy is probably the one who touches the most equipment on a daily basis. When that guy does the lube routes, he is physically going and inspecting almost every single bit of kit on your site. Which means, although it's a little bit depressing that he's sort of like thought of as the lowest guy on site, that to me represents a huge opportunity, right? He's the guy who's probably your first line of defense when it comes to machine failure. If anyone is gonna pick up that something is wrong with the equipment, just something doesn't feel right, that's the guy. He'll know what the oil is supposed to smell like, what it's supposed to look like, and he'll pick that up. He'll know when something, is, it sounds a little bit different. And so if you can bring him into the fold, I think that that's a massive opportunity at most sites. Now again, so far we're talking theoretical. So what's the, what's the What's an actual real world scenario where if I focus on a lubrication program, what are the gains? So there's a reasonably famous, I say famous, famous in my world, not in anyone else's world. Famous study done uh, at Nippon Steel and Sumitomo Bearings where they made a concerted effort to concentrate on their lubrication program and to see what kind of effect it had on reliability. And the number of bearing failures goes down dramatically. Now, it did take them a decade, right, of concerted effort but you're going from a number of bearing failures in the order of 400 to in the order of 100. And again, with that Pareto principle, we're able to eliminate almost 80% of those failures in that sort of, by eliminating you know, a bunch of the root causes up front. Now, you might also say, well, how can you measure the effort they put in here? Like, where's the scale for effort on lubrication? So, as a proxy for it, they also looked at hydraulic pump failures. And as a proxy for how much effort are we putting into our lubrication program? 
the blue line is just how many filters do we have on site, right? So when they were looking at the quality of their oil and the cleanliness of their oil, they say, look, okay, we're not going to finesse this too much. Let's just say how many oil cleaners do we have on site versus the number of hydraulic failures. And obviously, you can see that they're inversely proportional, right? So this is real world applications of it. Now, for anyone who was in Simon's talk yesterday, he talked about the idea of the DIPF curve. Right? So where is it that lubricants play a role in this DIPF curve? So there's a couple of different ways that we should really be thinking about it. So in the reactive domain, where we're just running to failure, well, we don't need to talk about that too much. Not, not to say that reactive failure is always bad, right? In some cases, run to failure may be a perfectly legitimate strategy for, let's say, for example, small equipment that is really not worth your while to go and inspect, right? Um, you know, tiny electric motors that you have in a food plant, if you've got a thousand of them, realistically, you're not going to inspect them. Okay, then you, then you go into uh, preventative maintenance. So preventative maintenance would be, I'm changing my oil at a fixed interval, right? You do this on your car probably, or you're supposed to do it on your car, right? I'm changing my oil every six months or 10,000 Ks or whatever, whatever the manufacturer has told me to do. Then you get into the predictive domain, and this is where we're starting to talk about oil analysis. And I think there's, there's a huge scope to improve people's oil analysis program, because without that understanding of chemistry, you can't interpret the results. But not only that, I would say the vast majority of, of situations, people aren't even looking at the results, right? They're doing it as a tick the box exercise. I send off my oil sample, it comes back with a report, I file the report away, I've done my job, the insurance company won't ask any questions, right? But that's the predictive domain. Then we get into the proactive. What does is, what is proactive lubrication look like? It's all about trying to prevent those problems before they occur. So it's about cleaning up the oil, right? If, if all the failures are produced as a result of contamination, having clean oil that's going into the machine, having good storage and handling practice, practices, that's all proactive. And then right up front, you've got the speci specification, right? Am I choosing the right oils? Am I choosing energy efficient oils? All right, now in my experience, right, as you go from the bottom of the list to the top of this list, as you go up, right, broadly speaking, the quality of the lubrication program starts to get a little bit better, right? However, I would also say that the disparity between where they think their lubrication program is and where their lubrication program actually is also gets bigger as you go up this list. Often you talk to guys in the mining industry and they really think that they've got it sorted. And then you sort of peek under the hood and you discover all the horrors. Whereas everyone in sort of like the water, food, pulp and paper industry is very upfront about how bad their lubrication program is. <coughs> all right, last one. Enabling renewable technologies. So, wind turbines. You might love them, you might hate them. Either way, they use a wind turbine gear oil. And what's amazing is that up until about five years ago, we didn't really have wind turbine gear oils. Most of them were repurposed industrial gear oils. Right? We just hadn't had that development cycle. The current generation of wind turbine gear oils are specific for that application. Now, wind turbine gearboxes are a bit of a modern marvel of engineering, right? There's high precision, there's very little backlash in those. There are big planetary gear sets that have to take a lot of torque. Very impressive. The challenge is doing an oil change up power, very difficult, very expensive, very annoying. Increasingly, as we're moving into offshore environments, that's even more difficult, right? You've got sailor guy out there to do. So, Modern lubricants are kind of stepping up to the plate, right, to, to manage that challenge. So now, the newest generation of uh, wind turbine lubricants are designed for a 10-year oil change, right? Now, the gearbox is only supposed to last 20 years. So theoretically, on these offshore wind turbines, you change the oil once during its life. Now, what does that do? That pushes oil condition monitoring into that sort of critical zone. If you're not understanding the condition of your oil, then you are leaving a lot of value on the table. Next, we can think about the electric vehicle revolution, whatever we want to call it. Again, people love electric vehicles or they hate them. Either way, it's been a huge technological change. Now, initially, for people in the industrial sector, you might go, well, what's the big deal, right? We have electric motors, we have gearboxes, that's all uh, an EV is, right? Really not complicated, especially if you're from the uh, electrical or mechanical world. No. Now, with EVs, obviously range is super important. And so everything, the difference predominantly between fixed plant and mobile equipment 
is weight, right? I pay a penalty for any additional weight in an electric vehicle. So what most of the EV manufacturers have gone to is a combined electric motor transition, uh, transmission, right? So it's all housed in one, in one box. Now, again, you might think mechanically and electrically, that is a very, very simple solution, right? What's the, what's the big deal? The problem is chemical, right? So all of the molecules that we used to use to protect gearboxes, sort of like the sulfurized olefins, there's a lot of phosphorus-based additives, they eat copper windings for breakfast. And so to have the one blue boil system for an electric motor as well as a transmission is, lubrication speaking, a terrible idea. And so there is actually a race going on at the moment with a, a considerable amount of research and development going into, well, how on earth do we balance those competing interests? And they're developing completely new molecules for it. Then we've got the internal combustion, right? Where we're trying to remake the internal combustion engine effectively. So we have a lot of experience working with alternate gases, right? So uh, a good example would be uh, sewage treatment plants which are producing sour gas. We do that in landfill gas, right, as well. And we've learned how to manage some of the, um, you know, acidic byproducts that come out of that sort of combustion process. But increasingly, as we're trying to decarbonize, let's say, for example, the transport sector in aviation as well as shipping, we're having to look to alternate fuels. So ethanol combustion would be an example. Methanol combustion. They're looking at ammonia. They're also looking at, at hydrogen. Now, on the face of it, this is reasonably simple. We have engines that run on compressed natural gas, for example. How different can a combustion engine be that runs on some of these uh, renewable fuels? Well, again, this is, one, this is one issue where the OEMs have like all these grand ideas and they go and they, they put technology into the market and then they never told the lube oil specialists, right? Because as an example, if you think about the combustion characteristics of hydrogen, hydrogen has a flame temperature that's about 500 degrees more than methane. Right? So the thermal stresses that the oil has to go through, way higher. What do you produce when you combust hydrogen? You produce a lot of water. Water and engine oils do not play nicely. They tend to form emulsions. Right? That's just the way that the chemistry works. So that is a challenge that we're going to have to overcome. Same thing goes for ammonia. Right? Most engine oils have these things called detergents in them. The whole point of having those detergents is that the byproducts of combustion are usually acidic. So these detergents are what we call overbased. So bases neutralize acids. Think about ammonia. If you get any blow by past the piston rings, ammonia acts as a weak base. Now we don't have engine oil that are designed to cope with that. So that's going to require a complete reformulation of all the lubricants. Now, the complexity with ammonia goes even further than that because some of the combustion products are acidic. So you're producing acids and bases at the same time. All right. So, for us to, to move forward with renewable technologies, we're going to have to come up with all kinds of different lubrication technologies. And for the most part, you guys won't have to be involved with that, but if you're ever involved in the implementation of new renewable technologies, you need to understand a little bit that the lubricants is usually trying to catch up with those new technologies, right? And so again, I mean, if you've got questions, just come and ask. So if, you've got, if there's some numbers that I can leave you with today, remember, 23%. Right? It's the total amount of energy that's lost due to friction. Right? Makes it a really, really big price. And monetarily, I would, I would put in the ballpark that about 5% of your total budget is probably up for grabs in terms of focusing in on your lubrication strategy. And finally, 70% of those machine failures are what's, what's at stake. Right? All right, so ultimately, a focus on your lubrication strategy what we're aiming for is more reliable, more, more sustainable, and more profitable. Thanks.